Hello everyone again. Uh, in the program you see a picture of a younger guy, but you have to stand with me for 25 more minutes here. Uh, Håkan, who, who you saw as a picture in the, present, in the program, uh, wasn't able to join us to Berlin. Uh, he's one of the modelers in, in my team. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I, I have some comments related to, to this project, but let's skip this right now and move on to some other slides and some other projects. Uh, one of the reflections that, that can be related to this model is that simulation can be quite seductive, uh, which is a dilemma with both a good end and a bad end, I would say. Uh, visualization can, if one decides to, almost always put the issue on a higher and more informative level than the alternatives. And that's good. Uh, if the visualization is removed, reduced, one of the major objectives is often lost to support understanding. And finally, without the visualization, one often has a hard time, at least in complex issues, to convince the stakeholder of that the various conclusions results are correct, relevant, independent of the quality of the results. Uh, you, you are probably, all of you probably have some type of experience of writing very good and long reports of uh, perhaps 150 pages, but there is a tendency that it's hard to get these reports to, to lead to action in the other end, so to say. And simulation can, in those cases, be a communicator of the results of the reports. So I would say that if we say that uh, level of value added can be symbolized by, by some type of scale. The reality is often that the understanding with models like the one I showed goes up quite a bit related to the issue at hand. The rational value, as I commented, does also go up, but not as far. And the danger, the risk is that since the visual uh, understanding goes up so far, the expectations when it comes to the rational values tends to also go up as far. And that's of course not the case, because we are dealing here with a complex issue uh, and it's impossible to give a perfectly correct uh, prophecy of how things will look in the fu future uh, with an issue like this. So, so that is a risk to be aware of, that the strength when it comes to visualization also has a downside. You have to, at the same time, uh, put the, the expectations when it comes to the rational key performance indicator conclusions down a little bit. Uh, another thing related to the project we just saw is that there is a tendency uh, and, and there is a will, will, especially in the healthcare system, to mix data that are quite detailed with visions and forecasts that might have uncertainties that are this big. And we discussed that uh, related to a question uh, earlier. And I sometimes do this little comparison that lay, let's say that we have a hypothetical little problem to add A plus B, and we know that A is 7.198, but we know that B is somewhere between 5 and 11. The answer is, of course, not or should not be 15.198. It should be somewhere between 12.198 and 18.198. The problem is that in healthcare and sometimes in other worlds that are so focused on data, they want to fill, when I started with this NKS project, they wanted to go down into patient groups, divided it up into thousands and thousands of patient groups addressing an issue like this. Uh, and I had to say, stop, we, we will not do this because adding detail uh, based on data like that will not add anything to the final conclusions uh, given the issue as hand but there is a tendency to want to build in also detailed data into issues that have other parts that are very undetailed. And that's a danger because it might uh, affect the expectations of having more detailed results than you really have. 
and given this, I would say that there is a relationship between data and whether they should be based on history and evidence or whether they should be based on estimation, guesses, visions, and rather intervals and, and, and um, rather intervals than values. And there is a relationship between the abstraction level and really the data. This is, of course, not the truth in all the cases, but uh, quite often it is. So if we have a situation like this, we have two rough data. Uh, and this is, um, uh, often re results in that the detail model in some way is reduced by the data level, and that's of course not something good. Often we can address the, this if we are aware of it by doing more experiments, by trying to look at, at both ends of the scale when, when we have some kind of a variation to, to address. So it, in some cases it, it can be handled even though we have that position. If we have that position, uh, we have to detail data. This is of course not wrong in theory, uh, because, because uh, it, it will not hurt the end result. What it will hurt is the expectations related to the end result. Uh, and that's really something that was very evident in the MKS project. I will skip the rest of this picture. Uh, the type of system thinking a person like me stands for is something I would call practical system thinking. And I usually describe it like this, that we have some type of a reality and I have stolen with pride that picture from XG Technologies. I think it's a good picture of a system. Uh, we have some type of reality and we build a model simplifying this reality into a system. We then, by building a model, we really divide the reality into some relevant dimension components or jigsaw pieces. And when we have addressed or identified these components, then we can start giving them val values with the help of quantifiable data. And we can make a parallel with having problems in real life, formulating an issue, uh, identifying relevant aspects, and giving input to these relevant aspects. The problem as I see it is that, especially in healthcare, there is a tendency when we have a problem in reality to directly jump down there, to directly start looking for data. I try to stand for, for in the healthcare system in Stockholm, for a, com a complementary point of view, to instead of starting there, we start there. With or without data, we start trying to understand the system as such, and the logic in the system, and the forces that drives the system, then we know better what data we really need and what data we don't need. So that's what I would call practical system thinking. Uh, and we went into this discussion a little bit earlier also. Evidence-based, no. Uh, what I have shown and will show will not be cases of evidence-based modeling and simulation. Uh, I would say that a well-carried-out simulation project lands a bit up on the scale when it comes to level of certainty related to the results. The thing is the alternative often lands somewhere there in the situation we, we have decided to use modeling and simulation. The comparison tends to be there though. Uh, as soon as you started to show a simulation model, you are questions, question whether uh, it's totally evidence-based, totally verified, whatever, uh, and usually it's not in the types of, of problems I run around with. But the thing is, it's really this comparison you have a reason to make. Uh, and sometimes also in the academic world, simulation is called the third science. It's not totally evidence-based, it's not based on uh, research, all the form formalities in research thinking, it's not totally empirical, in some, it's somewhere in the middle between, or both ends, or whatever you would call it, or neither, neither of. So I know there are some academics that use the term third science for modeling. Uh, this is the second logic I use when I try to explain, and this will lead to my second model, 
uh, when I try to explain why we use simulation, and this is really a copy of the XE Technologies uh, way to describe it. We have a problem. Uh, an option in some cases might be to do experiments in the real world, pilot projects or something like that. That might be expensive, it might be impossible, it might take time, it might be unpopular. So in some cases we have the reason to jump up in the model world with a simplified model, use it, get at least in the model world to an improved model and our hypothesis is that this tells us something about a better solution in the real world. Not the best one uh, by necessity, but uh, one, that, one that is good enough and one that where we have been able to make some of the mistakes up here in the model world instead of making them in real life. Uh, so now we will raise the abstraction level. We looked at the whole hospital. Let's look at the whole county in this model. Uh, and this was really the issue that was presented for me after quite some success with, with the previous model. Uh, one of the decision takers said that we have a problem. The, the population is growing in Stockholm. Uh, in average, we are all getting older. Uh, and we are doing a bunch of major rebuilding projects in the Stockholm County, building the new Karolinska Hospital, making major changes with all the other hospitals, <coughs> trying to change the whole healthcare system. And during this next 10 to 15 years, we still must be able to operate the patients. Uh, how will it be done? Help us simulate it. Okay. Uh, and then again, that, that's a typical example how a project description might look in our end. Then we have to make something out of it. Uh, how do we help an issue like that with, with tools like <laughs> modeling and simulation? So again, this will not be an evidence-based model, but it will handle quite the complex and quite uh, all-embracing uh, issue. Uh, the county of Stockholm. Roughly 2 million inhabitants. Uh, and this will be an example of a model that combines uh, discrete event modeling with agent-based modeling. This first page is really just some explanations and to play around with some of the basic parameters. Uh, these are, for example, the, the forecast related to inhabitants in, in Stockholm and we can play around with various scenarios here. If we move, move on to the simulation window, it looks in this case like this. And if I start up the model, uh, you see something happening in the model. And, and, and what these small green dots stands for, each green dot is 1,000 inhabitants. Uh, and the model does not say that we have exactly 1,000 inhabitants living exactly there, but the sum of all inhabitants in this community up here called Notelia will be the population of Notelia. So I've just spread them out to, to, uh, around the, the border of, of, and I try to not to put too many in the sea over here. So, so most of, of these inhabitants live here on land. Uh, and, and the same goes for all the counties. So here you have the city of Stockholm. The, this whole picture is the county of Stockholm. Uh, and uh, these little rectangles, they are the major hospitals in Stockholm. Uh, and in this model, we, we uh, build, uh, decided to build in eight of them. Uh, what happens in this model is that it, it uh, runs over time. And every now and then, some of the thousand inhabitants in one of the green dots suddenly feels, hey, I need an operation. Uh, and when he or she feels that, she also uh, asks herself, is this uh, an emergency or is this a non-emergency? Uh, what's called an elective need rather than an emergent need. Uh, if it's an emergent need, it's this uh, agent that's placed here is transferred, or rather the individual is created and becomes an individual, a red individual. If it's a more elective need, the individual becomes a yellow individual and moves really to one of the hospitals. And we can also in this model play around with various decision strategies. 
Right now, the choice of the individual or the system is to go to the closest hospital that still, that still has free capacity to handle this type of problem that, that this specific individual has. But we can play around here a bit and we can uh, stop taking, uh, taking into account whether there are free capacity or not. We will in a few seconds see a massive, there we go, uh, a massive effect because now all the elective patient will move on to the hospitals uh, even if they are closed, even if there are no free capacity, even if they are all full. So, so that was just the start effect when I made that change. In reality, of course, we, we do to some extent want to take account for whether there is free capacity or not. Uh, we can play around with other decision strategies. Instead of taking the nearest hospital, we can have some type of a priority between the hospitals and so on. Uh, when I press the button and the model ticks on, what happens is that all these uh, indicators starts, of course, producing some kinds, kinds of estimates and results. And the aim for this model, again, it was not to present a picture of exactly how it is. It, the aim of the model is to better understand the challenges given various scenarios with a whole bunch of different parameters that affect the scenario and better understand during the next 10 year time which of the years during this uh, t 10 year per period will be the most challenging ones. When will, will we have the biggest problem to match the capacity level or rather match the need level with the capacity level that can handle the need of operations in the county of Stockholm? given all the changes and things that are, that are moving around. And I could talk about this model for quite some time, but, but uh, let's instead summarize it a little bit. And I think this time, since you had so many questions for the, for the last model, uh, I will, I will, let's take all the questions at the end, since, since, so, so I will have the chance to show a few more models. Uh, so really the purpose was to raise the understanding related to the decision taking in this case. Uh, the system was the whole county. The stakeholder was the county and, and uh, the people responsible for the county end, which is both the ownership and, uh, and uh, the ordering end of the, of the county organization, if you remember these three roles inside the healthcare system. The time frame was a bit unclear, but really a continuous support during a long term decision process. Uh, simplification uh, and, and other aspects. Uh, that I focus quite a lot on describing the need uh, and describing different scenarios for how to describe the need of operations and healthcare related to that. Uh, the capacity end was the real challenge and um, to estimate the various capacity uh, and to be able to estimate the total capacity of the county the way to do that was to try to estimate the capacity of each of the eight major hospitals and add them together so to say and i would say at so far the usage of this it's been ready for one and a half years uh, from a logical model point of view. The usage is so far non-existing and that describes a little bit how, how things work, uh, which I try to describe in the healthcare system. Uh, because I did start with trying to build the model, uh, which was an iterative process. Then when we were close to finish, then the, I had the need to in some way establish what limitations are found in the major hospitals. And you might imagine the situation that arises when I start going to hospital management and uh, nicely asking, how do you see upon your own limitations? That's not an easy to discussion to take. Uh, and it, I, I, I took it for quite some time with a lot of good, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite good discussion, quite um, high, high level and high temperature in the discussions. Uh, and 
when, when it came to the small hospitals, I got really the input I needed. When it came to the larger hospital, I didn't and still haven't. And I decided to be a little bit passive because we have had some quite tough discussion with uh, all the hospitals the last one to two years because we are discussing which investments to make in all the hospitals in the Stockholm County. And that's very sensitive discussions to take. Very political, all the, the hospitals are competing with each other to get the largest, largest piece of the pie. And it was not the right timing to try to enforce them to bring me the input I needed. So, so this is uh, put, put on hold right now, but I will re revive it in, in perhaps half a year or time or something like that. And that's the way it goes in, in the type of projects we run around with. Some we go the whole way, some uh, stops in some kind of a timeout position and has to await other developments. Some stop and, and are not re revived later on because uh, the political decision changed for, for some reason. Uh, so that's why we also try to contribute on a very broad basis, running around and helping out in very many different circumstances. How many? Five? Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Uh, this is a picture that I use to explain, again, simulation. And uh, there is an Englishman called Michael C. Jackson who has written a book called System Thinking. And he claims that there are two types of systems, simple system and complex systems. And he claims that in some cases, all the participants in the systems are, have the same aim and the same uh, agreement when it comes how to reach that aim or objective. That's called unitary systems. In some cases, uh, the participants have the same objective but they differ in opinion when it comes to how to reach that objective. That's called the pluralist uh, participant group. And in some situation, the, competitor, uh, the, the participant in the system compete with each other. That's called the coercive situation. And uh, Michael C. Jackson, he says that uh, hard system thinking, operations, research, more ma mathematical methods, they are good in this box. They are good in handle simple unitary issues. Michael C. Jackson does not say, but he should, I say that simulation is good at handling any type of issue because simulation is a descriptive method, not a prescriptive method. And that's really why simulation can play a role independent of the complexities related to the system by describing it. Again, not giving an evidence-based result, but at least understanding more. And to have the time to show you one, possibly two more models, I skipped more PowerPoint pictures, and I'll show you. Now we move down in abstraction level, and we move down more to a classical discrete event modeling, following the patient's flow in the healthcare system. Uh, this model was the last model I built as a consultant two years ago. Uh, I built it for Pfizer, and Pfizer are using it in their sales activities. Uh, and they use it to raise the level of the discussion with the customers they have. Uh, because this model tries to address a situation where Pfizer has a new method of treatment, and they want to convince their customers or potential customers that given this method of treatment, uh, there are a possibility in the customer end to reduce, not uh, to reduce the cost of the operation by using this new type of a treatment, which implies a new type of process in, in, the, in the hospitals. So this model, in parallel, compares two scenarios. The old way, which is a surgical way to handle this problem, and the new way, which is, of course, the, the way that Pfizer is trying to sell, to have a new type of treatment. And this model we can toggle around with looking at results and various things. And we can look at the processes that are used in behind to describe, in this case, uh, the new treatment uh, the, the fi that Pfizer tries to sell, and in this case, the old treatment. Uh, 
And as a matter of fact, I leave this one now and briefly, briefly show the last model I plan to show you. And really the reason I wanted to show several models is the fact that we run around from here to here, from here to here. We do it in the whole healthcare sector, we do it towards all the st stakeholders. And in the long run I plan that we also will be running, oh sorry, the same model. Uh, that we also will be running around outside the healthcare sector in other counter-related issues. And I will take uh, emergency where have it? There it goes. This last model is a generic model to look at emergency departments, independent of layout, independent, really focusing on number of various physical resources and the processes that that uh, that exist inside. Uh, an emergency department. So it's trying to be a generic model looking at the de in emergency department. Uh, here we play around with uh, the manning uh, of uh, the manpower planning and the manning. Here we play around with if we want the rooms to be specialized or not. And here we play around with the priorities and the inflow of patients. If we move on to the next window, here is the structure of the inflow over the, um, each day of the week and each hour of the day, which varies very much for an emergency department. Here are timing with variation, here are other stuff, and here are resource parameters. If we start this model, and we speed it up a little bit. I'm soon finished, Tim Uh There is a process in, in behind where all the parameter choices we have made affects which uh, routes we take in this process description and of course we affect the number of resources of various kind and given this description we have more like this control board that presents in a balanced scorecard way the results given and, and the, the aim for this model is really to help when discussing investments in new operations, the, not, not operations theater, in, in new emergency department, in changing on the layouts, uh, changing on the number of rooms, changing uh, around the organization. And we have also created a generic model looking at an operations department instead of an emergency department. Uh, and now my time is probably out. Yeah. <laughs>